dermoids. I think epidermoids are ideal cases for endoscope-assisted technique because it's not a true tumor. It's like uh, a membrane which is um, like the skin secreting this material from the skin and it collects and it's spreading along the CSF pathways in each corner. It goes to the internal artery canal, it goes to the Meckel's cave, it goes from one compartment to the other. And therefore, it is really nice to have an endoscope to look around the corner. Otherwise, you have to ex extend the approaches, you have to drill more of the skull base to visualize them because many of many tumor parts are hidden behind neurovascular structures or bony edges. That's why endoscope assisted technique for epidermoids is really ideal. That first we come to the diagnosis. These tumors or lesions, they grow very, very slowly. And that's why sometimes they reach a very huge size before they become symptomatic. And frequently you have a wrong diagnosis to be an arachnoid cyst because these tumors are isointense to CSF and T2 and T1 weighted images. But if you see this irregular borders, then usually it's not an arachnoid cyst. Arachnoid cyst usually bulges everything with smooth, like a, a circle, it's like a circle form or ellipsoid um, displacement of the brain tissue. If you see these small nodules here, then it's probably an epidermoid. But the proof to be an epidermoid is easy when you use diffusion weighted images. You see in the B1000 image, you see it is a hyperintense lesion showing a restricted diffusion. Then it's a proof that is an epidermoid. And also when you make a post-op MRI, you see still a big hole, which is iso intense to CSF. So you never know is there really tumor or not, but when you make diffusion imaging, you can roll out there is tumor remnant or it shows the remnant which you left intentionally. So the use of endoscope and microscope in these techniques is very good. For the CP angle, we use the smaller scopes. They have a diameter of 2.7 millimeters and different angles of view. So most frequently we use 30 degree or 40 degree to look around the corner and to resect. Very rarely we use 70 degrees. And of course you need some angulated instruments to reach this tumor which is not visible in a straight line. Otherwise you just see it, but you cannot remove it. Curved suction and curved curettes are very helpful in these instances. So I use the endoscope initially freehand just for inspection. So I don't like it to introduce the endoscope under the microscope because then you have to change the view from the monitor to your ocular or the other way around. And then maybe you make unintentional movement. So it's better you follow just the endoscopic view and go in to the surgical field. And then sometimes if it's a prolonged resection, I fix the endoscope to a mechanical holding arm. And then you have both hands free and you can make a bimanual dissection as you have used to do it under the microscope. This is our setup in the operating room with the screens. And the problem is with an endoscope, you have to be very careful for two main reasons. So this is a microscopic view. You see in the surface, you see still your neurovascular structure seven and eight and here trigeminal nerve even if you pass it and you work depths in the field here you see when you touch these structures so you have always a control although the view in the in the depths is not good you still see when you touch these structures when you take an endoscope as long as you are in front of all structures it's okay but if you go in between here seven and eight and you dissect in the depths you don't know what you're doing with the shaft of the instruments and that is a potential um, of damage to these structures because you touch them, although you don't want, because it's just not in your uh, viewing field. That, therefore, you have to be very careful. And the second thing is, when you have an endoscope and you place it in the depths of the field, it becomes hot. So the idea is when you make an endoscope, re endoscope assist resection that you irrigate a lot and you not put the endoscope in front for a longer time without irrigation. So when we have vestibular schwannomas, I fix it to dissect the part which is in the fundus, but then I irrigate a lot because otherwise you can have thermal damage to the uh, structure. So I just want to show you today some examples where I found 
the endoscope technique very helpful. This was a 32 year old female presented with Abducens palsy. And you see she has a huge lesion in the prepontine space. It goes bilateral to all areas. And this goes from the um, floor of the third ventricle down to the hypoglossal nerve. So what is the best approach? We made the decision to come from the left because she has more tumor than on the right. But with a straight line, you of course, you have a, a blind corners here where you can use the endoscope. So what we do is a supine position, turn the head to the other side and make a middle retrosigmoid approach. This is our approach. And then we open the system, release CSF. And then of course you have to dissect the tumor. Michael, is the video running well or it's not working well? It's, it's perfectly working, very okay. nice video. So we find, of course, we look for an arachnoid membrane to dissect. And you see here, we have small perforators which are very attached to the tumor. And these, of course, have to be dissected. And in my hands, traction counter traction is the best technique to dissect this tumor without damaging these small but important vessels. And I think it makes no sense to do this step under the endoscope. Of course, it can be done, but I think under the microscope, it's much better. So the combination of both is the best. You see, this is, an, this is the uh, pituitary stalk here. This is the floor of a third ventricle. And you see there is some tumor under the tent. So under endoscopic visualization, I open the arachnoid, and then I remove this tumor, which is hidden under the tent. So there's no need that I have to cut the tent. So you see, this is a view down in the, on the other side of the brainstem. Here is the basilar artery. And with a curved suction on a 30 degree view, I can resect the tumor on the contralateral side of, this, of the brain stem on the endoscopic visualization. It's a blind corner with, an, with a microscope, you don't see it. So this is after the resection, this is here a hypoglossal nerve. This is a lower cranial nerve group here. This is seven and eight, this is ICA. This is fifth nerve. And here is the tent. And here you see this is a pituitary stalk. So this is the amount of resection we get. Of course, I could not get this tumor, which is here, which is extending into the internal auditory canal of the right side, but this was not our intention. But you see, with the aid of the endoscope, I go far to the other side of the midline and can resect all this tumor here. And then after three or four months, we make a second surgery. And you see here, this uh, internal auditory canal, there's a tumor going in. And now I switch to a 30 degree endoscope and I can resect the tumor, which is under the nerve on a direct visualization with this curette. So it was a really a big help. I don't need to, to dissect too much. I don't need to drill. I could just remove it. And you see, that's the problem in the depths when you work here, it's the potential that you damage the structure. So monitoring, of course, is mandatory in these cases. But nevertheless, you may touch the, the nerve while you were working in the depths of the field. And after surgery, she had an abducens palsy and a facial palsy. But after three months, you see it completely recovered. And also her hearing is very good. So this was a nice case, I think, to show the advantage. There's another lady came to us. She had already two epidermoid resection some years ago, and she lost hearing after the first surgery. And she has a tumor, which is here indentating the midbrain and goes far down in the middle cerebellar peduncle. So the approach, what was done previously was here in supracerebellar infratentorial approach, but to go look down here with a microscope, you have no chance. Uh, that's why I thought with the endoscope, we can do a little bit better. So we performed a superior retrosigmoid approach exactly in the knee between transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus. And so my first question was when I exposed this, where is the trochlear nerve? So I could not see, is it displaced upwards or downwards? I couldn't see it. So then I used a 30 degree endoscope for inspection before touching the tumor. And you see here is the midbrain, there is the tumor. So where, where is the nerve? So we looked around and you see here at the tent, there is a nerve and is displaced downward by the tumor, so push to the midbrain. And with knowledge, with this knowledge in, in my mind, I know that I can go aggressively resecting here at the edge of the tent. Frequently, the tumor pushed the nerve up. And then, of course, you have to be very careful because you will damage it. But I know the nerve is not there. 
So I make a vigorous resection with a capsule from the tent. And then I come to the posterior part of the tumor. And I then I could identify here, you see there is a trochlear nerve and I follow the nerve and can dissect. And although this was a recurrent case, so there was still a plane to dissect, but it took a long time because millimeter by millimeter, I detached the tumor from the pia mater with a traction counter traction technique. And finally, I could have a gross total resection of this part of the tumor also with a membrane, which is frequently in recurrent cases not possible. And now you see, now I switch over to a 45 degree endoscope to look down into the cerebellar peduncle. And you see there is a tumor. I have a curved suction, a curved curette, and on a direct visualization, I can resect this tumor in this area. You see, it's a good resection of this part, which was still sticky. And also it was interesting because most of the part I could resect the capsule with it. So there was no endoscopically, I have no idea that there is any tumor left because here a little bit on the vessels, there is some residual capsule, but in the end, it was quite a good resection. And you see the post-op result after three months, the indentation is completely gone. And now it's over six years after surgery and no recurrence so far. Another case was a lady with facial numbness and hearing loss. And you see a huge lesion occupying the CP angle and also Meckel's cave. You see, this is Meckel's cave on the healthy side. And here you see marked dilation of Meckel's cave showing that it's a very slowly progressing tumor. And we discuss this case frequently in our courses. And many people say, yes, we make a, um, a, um, a combined subtemporal um, retrosigmoid approach. Some say it is an indication for a posterior petrosal approach. Some people say it's an endonasal approach. And some people say we make a stage surgery, we make a subtemporal here, and then we make a retrosigmoid here. And when I think it should be easy, her problem is clearly the compression of the brain stem in the CP angle. So my main target is here, this lesion. And then if I have removed this part, I take a 45 degree endoscope and I can look to the Meckel's cave. And you see this is a little bit hyper intense, so not, not like a typical epidermoid. So this shows there is more fat signal. So it, probably it is a dermoid tumor. So retrosigmoid approach, you see this is a petrous bone. Here is a tent, we open the arachnoid, you see there's some hair and it's clearly a dermoid, but it's soft and I can dissect it easily. Then I detach it here from seven and eight. Tumor capsule was initially not too much adherent, traction, counter traction, I could resect it. You see the trochlear nerve is running here, could be dissected. And then we come to the fibers of the trigeminal nerve. And these are very flattened, very sticky. In the CP angle, I could dissect, but when I come here to the edge of the Meckel's cave, it was so sticky, so I did not dissect. Otherwise, I would destroy the sensory fibers. You see, it's a noun, a blind curette under the microscope. That's why we switch over to a 45 degree endoscope. And you see how nicely you may look into Meckel's cave and then an the endoscopic visualization, all this tumor is mobilized and evacuated. Of course, I have to leave the, the uh, tumor capsule, but this capsule is very adherent to the thin fibers here. When you try to resect the capsule, you will destroy the vasculature of the nerve and you destroy the nerve and she will not recover. So it thinks this ill-advised to take the capsule at all expenses. Just decompression in this area, but in CP angle, I could resect it with a capsule. And you see the post-op image shows complete evacuation of the lesion. And she recovered uh, her hyposthesia in the face. And of course she will, she will get a recurrence after some years, but then we come again in and we'll take the tumor in the same way. So we don't take the capsule because here the fibers were so thin and so sticky, we just destroy the nerve. This was a lady with a headache and an epileptic fit. And you see, she has a lesion in the ventricle, but clearly an epidermoid. So what we do here, we make an endoscope assisted approach, navigation guided to come to the ventricle. And we use for this a tube. It's a 12 millimeter tube in the at the tip. Tube is under navigational guidance introduced into the ventricle. And then initially I don't use the endoscope because it takes too much space. So I just take a suction, remove the tumor. And for the final 
parts of the tumor, I use uh, uh, 30 degree and 45 degree endoscope. You see here is the tumor. Of course, the capsule is still there. It's not always possible to take the capsule because you destroy all the vasculature. And if it's very sticky, you just leave a little bit, which is attached to the veins. So endoscope assisted technique, then the tube is removed. And then I close the uh, corticotomy with fibrin glue to avoid that we get subdural CSF um, uh, collection. And this is working very well if you have not a too much opening of the cortex. But if you use a small scope as a small tube with 12 millimeters, it's, it's nice to close it again. And this is the MRI. You see good resection, just a little bit of tumor remnants here attached to the veins. Another lady was a 6 year old female, decreased visual field, memory problems, and also aphasic attacks. And you see this is a huge frontobasal tumor. It's not so frequent this location of an epidermoid. So what we do is we just open the arachnoid and then we evacuate. And although this was a virgin case, you will see that the capsule is encasing all structures, all the perforators, all the arteries. And then of course, it makes no sense to, to go here, you see, to make a gross total resection because when you do that, you will damage the vasculature and also of the nerves. When you take it from the nerves and there's not a good plane, you will destroy the blood supply to the nerve and you will have neurological deficits. So we just remove the content. You see here, this is a carotid and it's completely encased with a capsule. Also the perforators here from the anterior cerebral artery, you see this, all capsule, all attached. So in these cases, we just take the content and leave it alone. Otherwise you will not have, you will not get a good neurological outcome. Take more tumor, see oculomotor nerve, take it out, dissect as much as we can. All is under the microscope so far. And then when you don't look very well, you have a blind angle. We go in, you see the oculomotor nerve here, the basilar artery. You can check this area. And when you see a residual tumor, we take a curved suction and to remove it. Here's some tumor remnants, curved suction, resection, but don't take these, it's all capsule, all capsule. All the perforators are in this capsule, so it makes no sense, just evacuation. And you see, we have decompressed it and she recovered with her problems of vision. This is another lady. She came with uh, facial numbness, hearing loss. And you see tumor going here into the internal auditory canal. And you see the tumor here on this side of the palms. So we make a microsurgical resection of all of the tumor. And then we use the endoscope to look into the internal auditory canal. You see seven nerves seven and eight. And under these nerves, you see there is tumor. It's not visible under the microscope. You have to open the canal to see this. But here on the endoscopic visualization, we can mobilize this tumor piece and we resect it. There's another piece hidden behind the nerves and you can get it out and have a gross total resection. And the final case was a subtemporal tensorial approach. You see there is tumor here. That was a, 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 a huge tumor, which we did surgery first on the other side, via retrosigmoid approach. And then you see here tumor in the hypocampal area. And in this area going down to the internal auditory canal. So we make a subtemporal tensorial, trans tensorial approach. I don't like the subtemporal approach because of the resection, which is always required. But here I thought it might be the best choice to get the tumor from the hypocampal area because there was no dilation of the space when you come from below coagulation of the tentorium and cutting of the tentorium. Of course, you have to be careful with the trochlear nerve, identify it, and then you see the trochlear nerve is running here. And then we resect this tumor after opening of the arachnoid. 
You see there is a good plane to the brainstem initially, but then in the back, it was very sticky. And then of course I have to leave a little bit of the membrane. You see here now, it's a blind corner under the tent. And then you can use an endoscope, take a curved suction, or cure it. And then you can mobilize this tumor and take it out. So always when you have a blind corner, you can take an endoscope and look around. So it's not a clear message when you use when, but if you, if you don't see very well, you just take an endoscope and you can have a quite good resection of this area. So my message is that for epidermoids, in my opinion, the endoscope assisted technique is really a very useful technique because you can look around the corner. You don't need to drill too much. You don't need to extend the resection. And regarding the capsule, if we have a good plane, of course, I try to remove all of it. But in many of these larger epidermoids, it's not possible. And it's not advisable because when the, when, the wall, uh, when the membrane is sticky to the nerves, you just create neurological deficits and that should be avoided. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Henry, for sharing with us those very interesting illustrative cases. And uh, of course, epidermoids and dermoids are, are the best tumors to approach with an endoscopic assisted uh, uh, attitude because uh, the tumor is extending all around the corner. And so with your endoscope, you can reach those corner. And uh, also the tumor has created a big, big hole in which you can place your endoscope. It's better than in other situation. Thank you so much. I know that you have to leave before us, uh, before the end of the webinar. So I don't know if there are some questions. I see that Marcos uh, rises. And so Marcos, please. Yes, thank you very much, Henry. Excellent thank talk. And um, I guess we, we share very similar philosophy. I have one comment and one question. The comment is related to the bilateral uh, epidermoid cysts. And I have seen you did an uh, excellent job removing maximum possible on one side, but leaving some uh, pieces of epidermoid of the other side, and then uh, removing these in another surgery. And I would recommend this strategy for, for this kind of uh, bilateral lesions, because we never know, we never know whether this patient may have a, a hearing loss. And in, if, if in worst case, this patient could have hearing loss bilaterally, or if the epidermoid is uh, close to the jugular foramen, then you may have lower cranial nerve deficits bilaterally just for a while, but this is sufficient to make aspiration, pneumonia, and so on and so on. So um, it was, in my opinion, very good strategy. I just would like to stress this point. Don't try to make heroic uh, removals completely from both sides. This is not necessary and could put the patient under risk. So this is a comment. And uh, a question is, uh, I've heard that uh, Storz company is stepping down from the neuro endoscopy um, next year. What is the solution? What are you going to do? Because you use a lot of uh, Storz instruments. Yes. So I hope it is a miscommunication to you that they step down. My, my, at the best of my knowledge, they worked very hard to get the, C, uh, the CE certification, but because of the new medical device regulation, it's very hard for them. They have to bring so many information. And also the, the TÜV, which is doing it in Germany, does not know exactly what, what, what should they check because it's all new to them. But as far as I heard, they work very hard to get okay. approval in the next year. But it's so a, it's not true, the information that they are really completely stepping down. From. Yes. If Storz is not lying to me, it should not be true. Okay. And okay. I don't think they do. I think they put a lot of effort to get this MDR regulations done. And that is a really, it's, it's a mess because yeah. most of the small companies in Germany, which were very good in medical uh, instrument maker, they all stopped neuro because they said it makes no sense. We don't sell much. We produce for ENT, we produce for general surgery, gynecology, because we can sell much more. 
And that is a really a problem in the innovation process because Stotz is doing no, no innovation. Great disadvantage, because, great yes. disadvantage for us. And but I think we must give them support. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. More there, questions? Is also, there is also one question in the chat. I let you answer. I have mine, but do you ever use lumbar drain to uh, avoid retraction? No, I usually don't do that. For these approaches, what I do, sometimes a subtemporal approach, it is correct, then I use a lumbar drain, but I try to avoid, this was the only case where I used a subtemporal approach. But in this case, so as far as I remember, I did not use a lumbar drain. But for subtemporal for sub approaches, for cover no more or so, I use lumbar drain. Mm -hmm. And also I irrigate a lot. Maybe this message is important. I irrigate a lot to remove all these contents and we don't have much aseptic meningitis, which is frequently reported. So I don't rem I remember maybe one case where we had fever post-op, but it's very rare because we irrigate a lot. Marcos, what is your experience with aseptic meningitis? Yes, it happens. It happens. And indeed, research right. is a good option to uh, decrease the ratio of uh, aseptic, aseptic meningitis uh, in the postoperative course. Yeah, That's for sure. And regarding the lumbar drain, I never use any more lumbar drain since uh, more than 15 years. And what I do when I have, uh, I would like to improve the re brain relaxation by sample for a subtemporal approach. I just put under navigation uh, a very small drain in the temporal horn, and it makes it makes it easier. And I, I never requested anymore to place a lumbar drain. It's made by the anesthesiologist in our hospital. It's uh, a long time since I have not used any more lumbar drain, which I have not found necessary. I don't know you, Marcos, uh, but... Almost never, almost never. Only post-operatively, if I have the impression that the patient may develop uh, CSF leakage. Yes. When you have, for example, retrosigmoid approach, we have an old lady, she has no dura, and she has a very, very yeah. pneumatized yeah. Um, mastoid cells, and you know she will get CSF leakage, and then sometimes she plays it, but it's rare, it's very, very rare. Yeah. yeah. And uh, surely not uh, systematically, for in my uh, yes. experience, almost never. Mm -hmm. There is one comment from Dimitrios Paraskevopoulos. Uh, learning curve, Henry. Learning curve is always there, of course. <laughs> you just have to be careful with an endoscope because what I recognize when we make the courses that people touch left and right, when you go in, you have to go the same way out, especially if you cross seven and eight and go deeper. When you, when you are in front, for example, for tumor remnants in the uh, fundus, then it's no problem because there is no nerve which you have passed, you see everything. But if you go deep down, then you have to be very careful that you don't make too much movements left and right because this yes, yes, may yes. damage. Also, when you have not enough space, when you go with an endoscope, you think, you are far away, but the, the outer, outer um, uh, edge of the endoscope may scratch the nerves. When you look, for example, for hemifacial spasm down and you can touch the ninth nerve because you don't take care. And as uh, Dimitrios commented, uh, for him, CP angle uh, endoscope assisted the procedure should be at the latest stage on the career. And so uh, at the end of the learning curve and not to start with such procedure at the beginning. I think you I think young people should start using it. It's it's just an instrument. It's like a microscope and endoscope. I think you can use it, but you have to be careful. You make easy cases where you don't need where you don't have the risk to touch something. For example, if you make an, an intracerebral hematoma and you want to look in the cavity, you can use it. So you should start with easy cases, not in cases where you have limited space. When you have limited space, that's a risk that you touch something. Also, when people say we, we make minimal invasive endoscopic approaches, sometimes the approach with an endoscope is larger because you need some space. When we make pineal cysts, sometimes we have a small, very small opening, and I tried to use it with an endoscope, but I could not move my instruments. That's why I make it with a microscope. Mm -hmm. You know, it is an, I think it's still an overstressing of endoscope means minimally invasive, but in my opinion, that's not true. One last question uh, from uh, the chat. Uh, in order to re decrease the injury, 
of the nervous structure by the endoscope, you can irrigate. Is there any other suggestion from you? By sample, what is the exposure time that you will allow or not with the endoscope? And when you, you remove the endoscope, I would say, after a short delay or long delay, never. So there is no there's no special time. For example, when we resect this schwannoma remnants in the in the fundus, then I fix the endoscope because I want to have two instruments by manual dissection technique, and then I irrigate. And then when you stay away, let's say 1.5 centimeters from the fundus and you irrigate a lot, you will not have a problem. But if you don't do that and you the all is dry and then the heat is acting, then of course you may have a problem. Light intensity of your endoscope? Which one? Do you for for, for um, endoscope assisted, we put it to 70 or 80. Okay. Never 100%. Okay, so I think, thank you so much, Henri, for uh, your talk and your very interesting comments. So I know that you are busy this evening, so I I uh, wish you the best. Have a nice evening, and uh, thank you again for being with us as usual, and, and best uh, wishes for uh, 2023 for you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind invitation. I am very happy to be in this section involved, and I hope Next year, we will continue. I also wish everybody, so, also particip participants, a Merry Christmas and a healthy yes, and man. hopefully a peaceful new year. Yes. Bye bye. Yes, bye bye. Bye bye, Henry. So it's time to move to the next talk. And thank you, Massimiliano Bizocci, to be with us this evening again. Please, you. Massimiliano, up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you hear me? Do you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, yes. perfectly. Uh, I'm so sorry that I'm in surgery right now, so I, wish, I, I will try to be uh, sharp and uh, soon after I have to go back to the uh, OR. And uh, uh, the issue I have to face with is uh, related with uh, craniovertebral junction uh, uh, endoscopic assisted neurosurgery. Do you do you see my screen, my slides? Yes. 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 We see. Yes. You you see it, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, as you um, can see, our experience comes from the Calabar lab first, and then is applied in uh, the uh, surgical. Uh, uh, theater. And uh, first of all, we will uh, try to understand which one of uh, the uh, granulatable junction 360 degree approach is most suitable for endoscopic assisted approach. But we will start uh, uh, first uh, with uh, the classic uh, full endoscopic approach, uh, which is uh, the one that uh, deals with the uh, uh, transmucosal, transnasal approach. Um, we, we can divide very schematically all the anterior, anterolateral, posterior, posterolateral uh, approach in uh, transmucosal and uh, extramucosal. Uh, transoral, transnasal, of course, are transmucosal, while extramucosal are retropharyngeal pre-carotid, retro-carotid uh, approach. The introduction of uh, um, endoscopy uh, was uh, uh, like a revolution in a microsurgical uh, approach to the uh, craniovertebral junction. And we all know the uh, previous experience on the cadaver as well of uh, the very first experience of CASAM 2005 on uh, uh, craniovertebral junction full endoscopic uh, uh, approach. Many times I like to show this uh, very simple but very clear slides dealing with the surgical domain of full endoscopic uh, approach by transnasal, uh, suitable for uh, um, lesion dealing with uh, clivus, all the clivus up to C1 and the tip of the odontoid, otherwise uh, not indicated. But this is uh, the um, Huffle uh, historical, uh, clinical and unlucky 
case of a young lady harboring a, a relapse of a, a craniovertebral junction chordoma, previously operated by transoral approach. And uh, we can see how full endoscopic approach is uh, able to identify and isolate the carotid damage. Soon after, we can reverse up to the transoral domain, the uh, endoscope, and in this case, in a few, uh, through microsurgical approach of the transoral area uh, is necessary to better deal with the, the uh, soft palate uh, uh, cordoma uh, location. So in this case, microscope is uh, uh, like a support of endoscope, just the reverse of what happens for transoral. Uh, this is a microsurgical assisted endoscopic approach, microsurgical assisted of uh, a full endoscopic approach. Uh, on the other hand, we have just the contrary for transoral. Transoral is most suitable for um, uh, lower cranial vertebral junction located uh, lesion with uh, a little control of the inferior third of the clivus and full control of the C1 arc and uh, all the odontoid up to the body of uh, C2. Uh, the um, cons are soft palate splitting and uh, sometimes the need of uh, uh, tracheostomy. The cons are a wider uh, surgical domain compared to transnasal approach. And this is uh, the classic visual identification of the green uh, spots um, consistent with the surgical domain and uh, uh, our experience uh, was especially focused uh, for many years on uh, transoral approach, endoscopic assisted transoral approach. And uh, we liked also to introduce uh, very early at the very beginning of our activity also, also neuro navigation and neuro monitoring. And this is uh, uh, one of uh, our very first uh, cases of uh, uh, transoral endoscopic assisted approach. This is a classic microsurgical approach of uh, uh, old uh, patient harboring uh, uh, cystic uh, uh, chondroma uh, of the cardiovertebral uh, uh, junction with the CUSA uh, sonopet. Uh, we uh, were able to um, perimetrate and uh, isolate the odontoid by decompressing progressively both the compact and the sponge components of the bone up to uh, a subsequent more clear identification of the posterior aspect of uh, the odontoid by microsurgical technique, further the bulking of the bone up to reach the transverse ligament, which is uh, this uh, uh, yellow transverse uh, ligament, which was uh, removed with the longer and uh, progressively uh, eliminated in order to better identify with the endoscope. This is the phase of an endoscopic assisted approach of the cystic uh, component of uh, the lesion. And uh, as soon as uh, the uh, lesion is uh, grossly removed, we are used to inject in the surgical cavity some contrast medium in order to have an indirect identification here before endoscope, after endoscope, we have an improvement of uh, the uh, surgical uh, um, area. Uh, and uh, that's why endoscope allows us a, a better visualization of the pathologic area. And then soon after endoscopic uh, um, use, uh, we return back to the classic microsurgical approach and uh, we close uh, in uh, two or three layers of the mucosa and it is uh, before and after anterior decompression with the endoscopic assisted 
approach. Another full endoscopic approach is the so-called Volinsky approach, which is a um, proposed re proposal, a revival of the classic uh, C2 infibulation for C2 uh, Anderson fracture. But the main limit of this approach is that the limited uh, uh, surgical domain on the odontoid, no control of anterior arc of C1, neither of all the clivus. So we like also to check into the literature which uh, of uh, uh, both endoscopic assisted and full endoscopic approach in transnasal and transoral area were most uh, suitable for success. And uh, with surprise, we found out that uh, uh, transnasal approach uh, has a higher incidence of CSF leaks, meningitis, reoperation, and uh, uh, velopalatine insufficiency. On the other hand, transoral is uh, uh, more contraindicated for the need of. Uh, Tracheostomy. So a little uh, revolutionary observation of Benzer group uh, convinced us that uh, transoral still deserve a role in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, craniovertebral junction surgery. But concerning uh, our experience uh, in uh, transnasal approach, in this case for uh, uh, impressio basilaris. Uh, this is a typical example of one of the risks that uh, we erroneously are used uh, or were used to consider typical of transora, the CSF leakage. CSF leakage uh, occurred only in one transnasal case in our series, um, and uh, it was uh, repaired according to the rules of uh, uh, surgical repair with a flap which was uh, uh, produced uh, by the was prepared by the autolog ENT and put on uh, the uh, CSF uh, area and uh, the glue and some surgical hemostatic material was put on and finally a balloon was uh, inflated in order to allow a better and more effective healing of the wound. What, but what happened, as uh, shown in this uh, uh, following uh, group of slides, was that the patient was very well in the immediate postoperative uh, time, but uh, seven years later on, when it was time to perform uh, posterior instrumentation infusion, at that time we were used to postpone seven uh, days after anterior approach, the posterior instrumentation infusion, an infection occurred and the patient died. So this is a uh, not secondary complication of uh, transmucosal approach. Uh, but with uh, our study, we moved also uh, into the uh, old fashioned submandibular retropharyngeal approach of McAfee. And starting from the more recent experience of uh, Sally 2017, we found out that uh, there is indication also for uh, clival uh, lesion. And uh, we started with uh, a simple C2 cordoma. And uh, this is the classic uh, McAfee modified incision, but we put some change by introducing an OR and uh, a neural navigation, and uh, again, microscope to start. And this is the microsurgical uh, um, image of a C2 odontoid uh, um, uh, tumor uh, consistence and appearance. It is a cordoma, C2 cordoma, before and after surgical demolition by microsurgical approach. But in this case, in this patient, harboring a clivus cordoma with uh, um, spreading into the uh, C1 uh, uh, lateral mass, right lateral mass, since the patient was harboring Beckett syndrome, 
which is uh, an autoimmunitary immunitary um, uh, vasculitis uh, with uh, uh, some inflammation on a mucosa of pharynx, pharynx mucosa, uh, we ruled out transoral and transnasal due to the risk to have a uh, um, wound uh, known healing in the post-op time. And we tried to check the submandibular uh, retropharyngeal approach for clival region with the help of uh, OR and in the operating room. This is uh, the green cross that show us that we should uh, reach the clival region. And so we are encouraged to use in this case um, with the, our modified retropharyngeal uh, submandibular approach, the endoscope, after uh, checking the uh, microscope uh, um, step one uh, surgical removal, which was uh, inconsistent due to, to the very hard and sharp obliquity of our surgical approach. Again, uh, the endoscope is uh, absolutely first choice after the failure of a microscope in this uh, operation. And uh, what we can see in these slides is the odontoid. This is the anterior arc of C1. And please look at uh, this uh, video. We reach the uh, lateral aspect of a C1 uh, uh, mass. And we try to debulk, but we have not enough control to control uh, in a full manner, all these uh, huge tumor. So after uh, withdrawing some uh, tumor fragments, we are uh, uh, pushed to stop. And this is the post-op control of the MRI of this uh, patient, just a, a clival biopsy. And uh, although the patient is uh, harboring uh, uh, Beckerschett uh, syndrome, we will explain to him that transnasal approach, classic uh, transnasal full endoscopic approach with uh, probably maxillary extension with the NT uh, will be provided uh, soon after. Again, returning back to the cadaver lab is the key because uh, uh, with uh, uh, cadaver with the uh, neural navigation again, uh, we can have uh, a confirmation that uh, trans, uh, among the uh, transmucosal approach, transoral is uh, wider than transnasal, at least the dible. And uh, again, among the transoral, um, the transmucosal approach, uh, the transoral endoscopic assisted still uh, an evergreen. Uh, uh, surgical uh, option, along with, if necessary, a combined approach with uh, transnasal. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Massimiliano, for sharing with us uh, all these different uh, endoscopic assisted microsurgical approach at the school base level. Very interesting transcervical uh, approach, endoscopic assisted. Uh, which retractor do you use in this situation to reach such a upper level before placing your endoscope? Well, it's good question, because this is uh, the, real, uh, the real problem. It's a very deep uh, and oblique approach. I use uh, both uh, the um, CASP approach with the long bulk, and uh, in the last one that I have shown to you, I use uh, also the um, croca uh, spreader because uh, uh, the croca spreader is enough long to reach the deeper part uh, of uh, the current vertebral junction uh, through the submandibular pharyngeal approach. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, we have to improve uh, a specific dedicated uh, surgical tools and armamentarium for uh, this new uh, extra pharyngeal and uh, promising uh, approach to be better understood. Uh, 
uh, with uh, some changed uh, uh, to the classic McAfee, we do not uh, isolate anymore the hypoglossal nerve. We do not isolate anymore the superior laryngeal nerve. We do not cut vessel, do not cut pain. We do not isolate the tripods, uh, arterial tripods, the carotid, internal carotid, um, external carotid, lingual artery, fascial artery, superior thyroid artery. We do not look for the vertebral artery. Very simple, straightforward approach, like lower approach. And we are preparing some um, um, publication to uh, promote uh, this uh, promising extramucosal approach to the craniovertebral junction, endoscopic assisted, of course. We cannot listen you. Your microphone is off. Oh, thank you, Marcus. Ah, ah, ah. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, so the, there is one question in the chat. Uh, and also maybe it's an advantage of the extra mucosal approach because when you use mucosa, the transmucosal approach, there is a risk of uh, infection. So one of the questions is which antibiotics do you use when you perform a transfer approach to avoid the infection or to limit the infection? You, you are mute no yeah. uh, we, we, we have uh, we use uh, the the standard uh, the standard uh, cephalosporin uh, um, uh, prophylactic uh, um, coverage but uh, no more than uh, 24 uh, uh, hours and uh, uh, generally we, we have not uh, any any problems uh, we we do not have any problem with transfer. Uh, we have some problems with the tracheostom. Uh, otherwise, with transnasal, since the obliquity is different and the, the need to compress the uh, soft palate with the endoscope is uh, absolutely necessary, uh, we can have some velopalatile dysfunction. And in that uh, unlucky case, uh, I showed you also CSF infection, papal CSF infection. Okay, thank you so much. I think you have also other commitments today, and maybe you will leave us uh, earlier. So thank you so, again, and uh, my best wishes to you as well for uh, 2023. We, you join us, and uh, you was uh, already very active in the team. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Uh, Merry Christmas Hello. to all of you. And uh, I have to return back to the OR right now, so I, I cannot attend to the beautiful presentation following my presentation. So have a good uh, day and Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you. Good luck Bye -bye. in surgery. Merry Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye, Massimiliano. So Marcos, uh, I think Massimiliano already introduced you. <laughs> yeah, <nice>. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you so, very much. I will much. share with you my... my uh, presentation. I hope you can see it. Perfectly well. Yeah. This is a short uh, contribution in order to uh, stress the um, utility of uh, endoscopy in vestibular schwannoma surgery. Um, I have no disclosures uh, for this uh, talk. The first paper we have published on this issue, it was 1996. It was, I was working with uh, Majid Sami in Hanover, and uh, we collected a series of patients um, with vestibular schwannoma operated by a retrosigmoid transmeatal approach. And we decided to check inside the fundus uh, whether we found find any tumor remnant or not. So this was the issue of that paper. So we used the endoscope uh, to check the fundus in regard uh, of tumor remnant. And uh, so the years uh, passed. <laughs> and uh, so I came to Tübingen and, um, and then we decided to check our 
um, statistical data regarding CSF fistula. And uh, we saw that um, from 2004 till 2019, among 5, uh, 1,400 uh, cases, we had 7% CSF fistula. Almost all of them treated uh, with the lumbar drain. In 0.7%, we have to operate the patient again. So, and uh, if we analyze the literature, this is a meta-analysis done by one of our residents, 3,500 cases. There was an average of 11% CSF fistula in vestibular schwannoma surgery. And, uh, but the variation is, is great. You see, in the first series of uh, Professor Sami, it was 9%. And later on, he could drop to 2% using fat and fibrin glue. So 9% to 2%. But you see uh, a great variation, but in average, 11%. Why, why there is uh, CSF leakage in such surgeries? So one cause would be the non-sufficient closure of the dura mater producing liquid accumulation outside of the dura. This is actually uh, an uncommon phenomenon. If you open the dura as a, uh, with a line incision, straight incision, and if you close it again, if you have to use grafts, then the risk is higher, particularly if the patient has um, pneumatized um, mastoid bone. But this would be one cause. And this can be even more evident in patients with uh, hydrocephalus. But another very important cause, and this is in our series, the most important cause of uh, CSF leakage is pneumatization of the dorsal part of the internodutory canal. When we have to open the meatus, we may open these cells and these can produce CSF fistula. So you see here one a clear case. We have a huge pneumatization of the petrous bone um, at the posterior lip of the meatus and also the mastoid. Interesting is that the pneumatization may vary a lot. We have uh, a number of cases without any single air cell, and we have cases with uh, great pneumatization of this bone. And this is, in our opinion, the major risk of CSF fistula in a retrosig transmeatal approach for acoustic neuromas. Again, here the technique, you have the tumor, you have the nerves, then you open the internal auditory canal and you remove the tumor. And this is what we do during surgery. We open this piece of we take out this piece of bone. And uh, we have done an analysis of uh, 133 um, uh, Petros bone CT scans. And we have seen that in one third of the cases, uh, this part of the bone is pneumatized with single air cells or many air cells. Uh, in two thirds is not pneumatized. So you don't need to do anything. The classical way we have closed this area in the past was using muscle and fibrin glue. You see here again, uh, at the end of surgery, we put muscle and fibrin glue so we could plug uh, the, the meatus with this, uh, with this material and, and closing the air cells. But with this technique, we had in the past, at the beginning of our series, also 11% CSF leakage. It's, it's very interesting because it's very similar to the literature. Uh, the disadvantage of using the microscopical technique is that you cannot see directly the opened air cell. You can only imagine that they are opened and then you make a blind closure with muscle and fibrin glue. The endoscopy, as I have um, told at the beginning it, uh, of my talk, 
uh, gives an opportunity to see the fundos, but also to make a, a, a scan of this area of the petrous bone of the drilled area, so you can detect opened air cells. That means endoscopy allows a direct visualization of the bone and the opened air cells. So here is uh, one case. I have shown this case maybe in another opportunity, but just to mention uh, what we do, you see here the, the drill demiators, uh, the posterior part of the internal auditory canal. This is a very important step of the surgery. Then we evacuate the fundus, and then um, we remove the tumor from the CP angle, preserving the nerves. This is uh, what the, the, the most important steps. And then at the end of the surgery, uh, what we do is we um, check the fundus of the internal auditory canal with the endoscope in order to see if there is any uh, open cell. So you see here in few seconds, introduction of the endoscope. And then you can check if there is opened air cells or not. So look, the two different techniques. This is using the microscope, muscle and fibrin glue, or using the endoscope, direct visualization, and then closure of these cells under endoscopic view with bone wax, and then with muscle and fibrin glue. So we decided to compare these two different techniques. Uh, we collected retrospectively 133 patients. We have used this technique and we compared with 33 patients we used, uh, where we used the, the, the endoscope with bone wax and uh, muscle and fibrin group. So, uh, here the comparison, it was uh, uh, 183 patients, not uh, uh, 38 patients, not uh, 33 patients. And you see here in 16 cases, we got uh, a CSF fistula, that means um, CSF coming down through the nose. We used a lumbar drain as a first step to treat these patients. In 15 cases, we succeeded. In one case, we had no success and we had to reoperate this patient. Um, and then it was fine. We using the other technique with 33 patients. We had in one case, CSF fistula, in the other case was fine. And using lobar drain, the problem was solved. That means um, using the microscope and muscle and fibrin glue, we had 11%. CSF fistula, and in 0.7%, we had to reoperate the patient. Using this other technique, we could drop the risk of CSF fistula to 3%, and this case treated with lumbar drain. I would like to show one example. Uh, here, this patient, young lady with large tumor, extremely pneumatized bone. This is a very risky case to develop uh, the, uh, the problem. Then we operated this lady, we put uh, muscle and fibrin glue at the end of surgery, she was fine. But three weeks later, she came back, you see the petrous bone is full of water, and she had CSF coming through the nose. So uh, we used a lumbar drain first, but it was not sufficient. She continued having CSF fistula, so we decided to operate her. And now I would like to show under endoscopic view uh, the finding. So again, she had CSF fistula, lumbar drain was not sufficient. Then I introduced the endoscope through the drilled area and I was checking the area uh, we had closed with muscle and fibrin glue. You see our muscle disappeared. And here you see this hole. This cannot be solved with lumbar drain. So the endoscope was uh, very useful in this case 
to give a direct uh, view to the problem. Then we closed this small hole with uh, bone wax, followed by muscle and fibrin glue. Then she was fine. She recovered, had no difficulties, and was happy again. So uh, in conclusion, this comparative study had shown that using the endoscope to direct visualize the drilled area of the internal auditory canal, we can detect better the opened air cells and we can close them better. And uh, the technique we prefer is to use a wax to close the holes first and then uh, additionally to use muscle and fibrin glue in order to avoid that CSF is washing out uh, the bone wax we have used. So we are happy with this uh, situation. Uh, we could not drop uh, the risk to zero, but um, it's nowadays between two and three percent. So we hope if we continue this technique, maybe we can achieve someday zero percent uh, CSF leakage. Thank you for your attention. This was uh, a very short uh, uh, talk on this very important issue of the use of endoscope for vestibular schwannoma surgery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcos, for this very interesting talk as usual. I have one question regarding the fistula to the internal auditory canal. When it happens to the mastoid cells, or when it happens, well, how do you manage that? Yeah, in the, in, in the area of the mastoid? Yeah. Yeah. So we, it's, it's very uncommon. It's very uncommon. Usually we uh, close the open cells of the mastoid with muscle and fibrin glue. So we don't put wax at the mastoid because we are afraid of mastoiditis. You have to use a lot of wax if you are closing the mastoid. So in the area of the mastoid, uh, we use muscle and fibrin glue. And of course, we try to do a watertight uh, closure of the dura. So opening the dura in a straight incision, you increase the chance of watertight dura closure without the use of graft. But if you, are, if you have to use graft because the patient is old, the dura is bad, then uh, we put the muscle and fibrin glue then you must think about the situation of put a, a, a lumbar drain on this patient from the beginning on. Uh, the, the CSF fistula we have observed in our cases, they were all, almost all of them um, originated from the drilled area of the internal auditory canal, not from the mastoid outside. If you, if you perform a control MRI and you see that the mastoid is empty of fluid, uh, how do you manage that? This is the first so question. At the, at the beginning of, Im immediately after surgery, the mastoid is almost always uh, with fluid inside. But this is not a problem because we know during surgery, fluid can come into the mastoid. This is not a problem. But if this fluid doesn't disappear after a couple of weeks, uh, or if the patient is having CSF fistula from the nose, then we have to put a lumbar drain. So our first strategy is use lumbar drain. In most of cases, it will solve the problem. But in particular cases, it will not. Then we have to reoperate the patient. And then for this reoperation, I, uh, I, I really uh, would like to stress the use of uh, endoscope in order to find the hole. You must see the hole, you must find the hole. Then you can close directly the hole. So blind closure is not a good idea. It's, too, uh, it's not um, safe enough. Okay. I have one, there is one question in the chat about uh, CSF cisternogram and fluorescein injection to detect the site of leakage. 
What is your comment about that? All right. We, you go to the area you have worked. So the fistula can only come from this area. And the most important, what I, I <clears throat> would like to, uh, to emphasize is the use of bone window CT scan before surgery mm -hmm. in order to see whether there is air cell or not. So if the bone is compact, the risk of CSF fistula is almost zero. But if the bone contains air cells, as I told you, in one third of the cases, you will find air cells. Then you do also post-op CT scan, CT scan, and then you will see whether you have opened the air cells or not. So in most cases, in almost all cases, CSF fistula is coming from the drilled area of the internal auditory canal. And you can see at the bone window CT scan, very simple. You don't need cystinography or CT cystinography or fluorescein. You don't need it. I don't see any, any other question in the chat. I think your talk was very convincing. And I had the opportunity to visit you in Tumigen and to see how you were systematic in your approach. A very interesting visit. I encourage all of you to visit <laughs> Tubing and to see uh, the perfect surgery. And uh, I was impressed to see how you managed the vestibular phenomenas and uh, how you handled with the sitting position also, all the tips and tricks you explained. It was very interesting. Thank you. Very kind. Very kind. And there is a... we can do one webinar someday about sitting position. Yes, for sure. For sure. So I think we, uh, Sebastian Frulich will not be able to join us. I tried to call him, but uh, I expect he will be again in the operating room. It was a very difficult day with uh, many activities for him, I think. So uh, he has to apologize and we can understand he's always present with us and do many efforts to be uh, uh, with us uh, every time as you, Marcos. So it, it was a pleasure to be with uh, all of you. It's the end of this year. I wish you, as I have said, the best uh, for uh, the coming days and the coming year, 2023. A lot of projects uh, will be with us very soon in 2023. We have a very nice program that will uh, follow each month. So. Thank and you. If I, if I want, uh, if, if I may say some words, I, I would like to thank you for the fantastic work you have done for us, for our community. And thank you also, Anna, for her tremendous job. And um, it was absolutely amazing, it was very nice uh, all, every time again to be here. And uh, the topics were very important topics. And uh, um, and the audience was also very high every time again. So really congratulations for your excellent job you have done. Please stay on this uh, field, <laughs> stay on this job. <laughs> Thank you so we, much. We Marcus. need you, we need you. <laughs> Thank you so much. The most important is that we work in a very friendly environment. And uh, yes, indeed, there are a lot of people attending our meeting. It is uh, our motivation. Uh, to work together and uh, to push the things a little further each time. So all the best. All the best to all of you. All the best to you also, Anna. And uh, also from my side, uh, thank you for all the things you, you do for the ENS and for the skill-based section. It's a lot of work uh, in background and uh, you have to open your video at some point and we, we will be able to congratulate you uh, and everybody has to see the, the incredible job you, you are making on a daily basis. Ah, voila. Uh, <laughs> so you see who, who is Anna and uh, working a lot with, uh, with us uh, every time. Voila, voila. So bye-bye. See you very soon. Merry Christmas, Happy New Merry Year. Christmas. See you very soon again. Nice holidays to all of you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Anna. Bye bye, Marcos.